on camera. I'm John Lilly, and I will be interviewing Paul Gann. Uh, we are at um, uh, Stone Mountain at the Park Springs Retirement Community, and today is the 9th of, uh, of May uh, 2019. Paul, would you please tell me your full name and, uh, and, and um, we'll go from there. Yep. I am uh, Paul Williams Gann, born July 17, 1923. My parents were John Adams Gann. My mother was Ruth Williams Gann. And um, I was born in uh, Midland, Michigan. My dad worked for Dow Chemical. I thought I was going to work for Dow Chemical, but life didn't go that way. I ended up with Monsanto Chemical, which I enjoyed. Did, uh, did you have any siblings? Uh, yes, um, I have an older sister. I'm the youngest. Then my uh, brother John and my other brother Ken. Both of them, all three of us, were in the um, World War II. Uh, John, my oldest brother, was a truck driver. He was involved hauling ammunition uh, during the African campaign. And um, the Italian, he, he went through, um, I can't remember the name of the town, but uh, he was involved in the Italian campaign. Okay. My middle brother, Kenneth, uh, ended up as a sergeant, and he was involved in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, all three of us came home un unscatched, and um, so uh, my mother was slightly relieved. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were fortunate. The um, Everybody in the family now that I grew my siblings and my parents have all passed away. So I'm the last of the Mohegans. I think you mentioned a sister. What was her name? Uh, my sister, uh, Virginia, she was born in Germany. Um, my dad, uh, when he finished uh, schooling at Case in Cleveland and then MIT, for his uh, bachelor's or master's degree in chem engineering. He, um, there was a professor in Germany, this is during 1913, uh, 14, and uh, he wanted to go to Germany to study under this professor uh, because he was a renowned, world-renowned uh, individual in a particular area of chemistry that my dad was interested in. So they went over there uh, in 1913, shortly after they got married, and um, came back in 1917. So they were there during the World War I. And um, my dad was, uh, much to my surprise, was rather outspoken. And, um, and he made it very perfectly clear that um, he was an American. And uh, when my mother was pregnant, he went to Berlin and had an American flag made. And that flag then was draped over the bed where my mother was in the hospital. And uh, so that my uh, sister was born under the American flag. <laughs> Literally. Now, she said, my, my mother said that uh, it was like Grand Central Station <laughs> because doctors and nervous, uh, nurses would come through the room to see this quaint custom that the Americans have. <laughs> it was not a custom, it was a s statement. Yes. So anyway, uh, everything went fine. Uh, it was a difficult birth, but that's another issue. Right. Um, then he came back, eventually worked for Dow. Um, when I was about uh, 
eight years old, it was, uh, I had already made my mind up as to what I wanted to do educationally and uh, professionally. I wanted to be a chemical engineer. I had no intention of going all the PhD route that my dad went, but he, he excited me in the area. And um, so I went to Michigan. Why? Because uh, I got indications that Dow was um, very pro-Michigan chemical engineers. So I uh, went that way and um, had about uh, two and a half, it was a five-year program. I was there about two and a half years before uh, I was drafted. I was uh, drafted, I think, in 43, mm -hmm. and um, around July, and uh, went to Keesler Field in Mississippi, just north of Biloxi, for basic training. Um, after basic training, uh, <clears throat> I was sent to Mississippi State College at Starkville, Mississippi, uh, in a electrical engineering program. And uh, unfortunately, I was only there a little over a semester, but it was a good experience. And um, one incident there was uh, we were taking a calculus course. <laughs> and I don't mind repeating calculus anytime I can, because that's a fundamental uh, math. And um, the professor was putting a derivation on the board. And he'd gone through a couple of blackboards and was coming around the corner to another blackboard. And um, all of a sudden he says, this isn't working out right. And uh, a fella in the back row of our class says, well, professor, go back to the first blackboard about three lines down. There's an error there. Well, it turned out that the guy who was speaking was a professor from Furman, oh. <laughs> and he was a mathematical professor. And I thought, holy cow, how can you be comfortable when you got somebody in the, in the booming student area who knows as much as you do? <laughs> Anyhow, um, that, that worked out fine. Yeah. And then um, uh, I was sent to Camp Crowder, um, which is in the southwest portion of Missouri and near Neosho, just outside of Neosho. Neosho is a tiny town. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I uh, learned uh, a little bit about basic radio. Um, I was in the Signal Corps by now, and um, the Army Signal Corps. And I learned to climb telephone poles. And um, the object, of course, was to climb a 50-foot pole. And you had to go all the way up, and tap on the top, and then you completed that phase of training. But they encourage you to climb a 90-foot pole. Hmm. Well, since I didn't have to, I wasn't going to. <laughs> but um, again, this was a good experience. And... Um, then uh, I was uh, pretty serious with uh, a classmate of mine, uh, she, uh, who I knew on a blind date, and we became pretty serious. And um, so the communications got kind of warm. And um, so uh, she came to, she graduated from Michigan in business and um, got a job up in Chicago with one of the big banks. And she came down to Neosho, and um, she had stopped by, she was from Springfield, Illinois. Her name was Pauline Estes, and, uh, but I knew her as Polly. And uh, she came, uh, stopped at a jeweler, uh, her dad with a CPA and, uh, this jeweler was one of his customers. And so she went there and bought a ring for $75. So 
It's all the money I had. <laughs> and um, uh, she um, brought the ring to Neosho. And so I gave her the ring. And uh, then the problem became convincing our parents that we actually were going to get married. And um, my uh, dad was against it. He wanted to wait until the war was over mm -hmm. and I finished school. Right. Uh, her mother was against it for the same reason. And uh, we understood their reasons and I said, you are correct, but that's not the way life is going to work. Mm -hmm. So we um, finally were able to convince them that, okay, we're going to get married and we're going to get married quickly. So um, uh, I'm still at uh, Camp Crowder, and uh, I had to get a three-day pass so I could get on the train, get up to Springfield, Illinois, and have a wedding and get back. It was all within three days. Now, I'm just a PFC, okay? And so the, between the chaplain and the captain, they played ping pong with me. Basically, because they would say, well, you go to the captain and see what he said. And he sent me back to the chaplain, and captain and chaplain. Anyway, this went on the ways. We set a date for the um, wedding, June 24th, 1944. And, um, but I had not gotten the pass. About four days before the wedding was to be, they gave me a three-day pass. Mm -hmm. So I was able to travel all night up to, to St. Louis and then over to Springfield. And uh, we got there at a quarter of 12. We had to run down, literally, to the, um, uh, the, the girl that, uh, clerk, the county clerk's office to um, get a, drive, or a wedding license. I am 20, and uh, as a result, my mother had to give permission. Yeah. So uh, things got a little, little tight time-wise, but we got there before uh, closing of the county clerk, got through all of that, and uh, then we went shopping to get me a, a clean uniform and a and, um, shirt and all. The, um, all of my friends um, were in the service. Mm -hmm. So the only person who I really thought so highly of was the skipper to the Sea Scout group in Midland that I had joined. And... Um, <clears throat> He he uh, was like a father to me, and um, earlier on I had joined as a result of my brothers, a Boy Scout group, but I did not feel comfortable with that group at all, and I heard about the Sea Scout group, and most of those guys were from the other side of town, and the, they I enjoyed, and so I was with them I think about three years, and. Um, we, he, Skipper Black, um, found a well-used boat, a 52-foot boat with a um, Sterling petrol engine in it and a concrete bottom that the uh, military had used uh, on the Great Lakes uh, during the war. Mm -hmm. It was actually built for a Vanderbilt. By the time we got the boat, it was in need of repair. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, we learned how to caulk the sides, and we removed the engine completely. Skipper Black had a garage. He was in the maintenance, car maintenance business. And uh, we tore the engine down completely, and I learned how to... Um, adjust the main bearings in such a way that they were uniform. And um, then we took the pieces back to the boat and reassembled everything there. And lo and behold, the damn thing worked. 
Now this was this was when you were growing up. This was in uh, uh, let's see, probably around nineteen thirty nine forty. Okay. In that period of time, mm -hmm. I'm in high school at that okay. time. Um, so then I get drafted in um, forty three, and um, we talked about the Biloxi and and all, and so now I'm up in. Um, Let's see, when they, at Starkville, I got, uh, <clears throat> there was a group of us that were alleged musicians, mm -hmm. and uh, so we created a dance band, and uh, my folks sent me down my trombone, and uh, uh, had this little dance band, which I was very impressed with. The... Uh, this is a picture of it. Just, just hold my space. Just hold, okay. I'm in the far left. You can almost see me. I see somebody with a trombone. And uh, we had three trombones. The leader was an excellent trombonist. And um, uh, we had two trumpet players who uh, were... These guys were professionals. Mm -hmm. They were maybe 22 years old, but they could play uh, any kind of music. And um, uh, one piece I really enjoyed was uh, the arrangement of uh, Dorsey's uh, Well Get It. Mm -hmm. And in it, there was a duel between the two trumpets. And these guys were perfect yeah. for that. Yeah. So um, that's just one of the areas that I thoroughly enjoyed mm -hmm. while at, um, at Mississippi State. Okay, time goes on. Uh, we actually, live, Polly and I actually get married and we get back and uh, found a little in a cheap hotel in Neosho where she spent uh, her several days, mm -hmm. and of course I had to go immediately back to KP. Right, that was uh, my my thrill for the day, <laughs> and um, leave her. But we got through all of that, and uh, then I think it was in November, late November, that uh, we were ordered to go overseas, and. Um, which we, uh, our, our team is what they call a fixed station team. Mm -hmm. And um, there was about a dozen guys, I think. Now this was, in, in this the, was 1944? Pardon? This was 1944, November? Yes. Okay. Yeah, about 44. And um, so we uh, left for California and uh, boarded the boat, I presume, either late November or early December. Mm -hmm. It was a boat from Portugal, and originally it was a freighter to haul fruit or vegetables or whatever the case is. And so it had a pretty strong aroma, <laughs> and uh, the crew uh, could not speak English. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did our things. And um, the... Uh, Let's see. The event uh, we were had, we finally ended up at Finchhaven, New Guinea, and uh, we arrived on December the twenty fourth during the day. And the first image that's still in my mind is that when you looked at all the troops around on the. Uh, on the ground, on the, on the uh, wharf and all, mm -hmm. they were yellow. I mean, to me, it was a very bright yellow because they had been on adabarine, which is uh, anti-malaria stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had been on it maybe for a week, but after a few months, you too will turn yellow. <laughs> but that was, uh, to me, an interesting picture. We... Um, the engineers, the Army engineers, had uh, built 
um, raised uh, platforms uh, for um, with a tent over them, mm -hmm. and uh, we had army cots and uh, mosquito netting over the, each cot. So you you just learn to live the New Guinea way, and um, uh, we had no military training while there. Uh, we did a lot of um, um, work on uh, repairing uh, cable spools, and because um, they the military, the action in the Finchhaven area was completely uh, got, completed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the action still in New Guinea was up in uh, Hollandia, which is in the northwest portion of um, New Guinea. Then um, we were shipped to the Philippines. And um, same situation. We worked in the um, the yards where the heavy cable were being uh, re-rolled and um, the, the flanges and we had to cover with wood and um, learn how to pound pretty heavy nails through very thick mahogany wood. Not an easy proposition. I think we had either one pound hammers to do that with well, and um and so this was 1945 by then is that right yeah i guess about 45 okay. yeah and um then the bomb was dropped and uh in august of 45 i believe it was okay and we were in kyoto japan in late the following september um, uh, probably about a month after the bomb was dropped. And we uh, were in the convoy uh, to Kyoto. And Kyoto, as my understanding, was off limits for any military action. That was the Emperor's Summer Palace mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of um, history and all for the comp country there. And uh, so it's my understanding that uh, MacArthur said, uh, we will not touch Kyoto, which was fine. We bivouacked in the art museum. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, all f paintings and all had been removed yeah. long before we ever arrived and were hidden. And so I really appreciated that, that much of uh, history being protected. We were in the art museum, which was a concrete building, um, for several months until the military was able to get some uh, barracks cleaned out and uh, us moved in. Um, the barracks were all wood, and uh, the Japanese soldier apparently slept on straw mm -hmm. uh, in kind of a web-type situation. Very uncomfortable. No room. They slept ver uh, maybe three uh, levels deep, and uh, not a whole lot of space between Mm -hmm. the level of where they slept to the next individual above them. Um, fire was the biggest issue, and uh, they uh, finally, c and, and fumigate the place, they finally mm -hmm. were able to get all the straw out and the, base, the place well fumigated. Um, then... Um, our job, my job, uh, was assigned to run some diesel-electric three-phase gener generator systems, and uh, which was uh, 
We ran 24 hours, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried to get all the night shifts I could get so I could have my days free, um, which worked out pretty well. And uh, so one day I was roaming the streets of Kyoto. And um, came across a set of buildings, which I said, these look like um, uh, school buildings. And um, couldn't read any signs and all. And I turned into the first building, walked down, started walking down the big wide hallway and peeked in the windows of the doors into the classrooms. And I said, yeah, this is a, these are classrooms mm -hmm. set up. And uh, while I was walking, there a fella came uh, f down the hallway and uh, we met. I'm in uniform and uh, he could speak English. His name was Colony and he was a lecturer in electrochemistry. Mm -hmm. And so we got chatting and over the next few days, we met a couple of times, and he found out what my interest was and um, introduced me to a professor, Shishido, that's S-I-S-I-D-O. He had a uh, organic, an advanced organic chemistry lab and class, and um, of course, I, he knew very quickly that I could not speak or read Japanese. They were using German textbooks. Yeah. I could not read or speak German. So uh, Professor Shishidu says, well, let me see what I can find. And he pulled out an English textbook covering basically the same areas of chemistry. And um, I uh, was then introduced to his uh, lab, um, which I happen to have a picture of, I think. Okay, thank you. It's not a good picture, but the uh, Remember, all students basically had gone to war. And so these are students who were not military. Mm -hmm. They were like us. They were interested in the subject matter, not in killing people. And uh, so the atmosphere was very congenial. And um, I think I was a curiosity. Um, I was the first alleged English-speaking guy uh, since early in 41 when the last Englishman had left the school. So um, uh, they wanted to practice English, and I said, fine, but I speak American, and you will find there is a slight difference. <laughs> so um, we got along amazingly well. Um, the laboratory was um, poorly supplied, which is expected. Uh, we did not have Bunsen burners. No gas was up there. And we had coiled, hot coiled uh, heaters. Mm -hmm. And they were always burning out. And so you learn how to replace a coil and, and get back in business. Fortunately, they had a glass blower, mm -hmm. and he was busy all the time. So if you need any glass work, a special kind, he could handle it quite well. I was, um, they had, um, I think six, maybe as many as eight students, excuse me, in the lab. The fellow that was right across the bench for me was a good six foot guy. Uh, the Japanese are either short or tall, depending on where you're from. And uh, he had a brother who was killed in New Guinea. And I thought, well, we may have a problem. 
But no, they were very philosophical about it. Uh, when it came to the uh, atomic bomb, uh, they were very philosophical about that. Um, I think they also understood that it took something of that sort to break the chain within the Japanese mm -hmm. uh, hierarchy. And when the emperor, apparently, that was such a controlled society that uh, and my interpretation is that when the emperor said, we quit, we surrender unconditionally, mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly what the entire population did. I remember as we drove um, up to Kyoto, it was kind of a misty day, and uh, at several of the tiny towns we went through, uh, where we might have to turn a corner, um, there was an elderly lady that would bow to every truck oh. that went by. Wow. And I said, that's not good. We, um, the war's over. We don't bow to anybody anymore. And, um, but that happened in, in several towns. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, um, so back to the Kyoto Imperial University. Um, I was fortunate to run into Kawane, to run into, to be introduced to Sishidu and to have the experience in the lab. The, um, I, uh, uh, when I was about ready to leave, uh, Professor Shishidu wrote a little note for me uh, to, uh, Wait a minute. That's that's a woo. That's that's a different subject. I pulled the wrong one. It's okay. Pulled the wrong. That that was accommodation for um, uh, the work that several of us did on creating a PX um, in in the Philippines. We started out in New Guinea, but we we did a pretty good job in the Philippines, mm -hmm. and we had accommodation from our Lieutenant, on that, and I thought that's worth keeping. Right. Yes. Then so uh, Professor the... Shishidu then wrote a uh, a note to to whomever to uh, explain what experiments I did and uh, whether they were satisfactory. It was a very complimentary note. Mm -hmm. um, then Doctor or Professor Shishidu said, uh, do you think the American Chemical Society would be willing to publish any of my work? So I wrote my dad, and uh, he contacted the president of ACS, and um, the president r replied, we are no longer enemies. Of course, we'd be delighted to publish your work. Mm -hmm. So I... Um, uh, relayed that to Professor Shishidu, and um, time goes on, I'm back at Michigan, and I decided, well, I wonder if that ever got published. And so I went over to the, uh, the Kim uh, Library and looked up, guessed about what time they might publish their books in the journal, and lo and behold, there was a uh, publication by Shishidu in the ACS journal, I think probably 1946. And um, uh, it, it acknowledged my dad's involvement in getting his um, okay from the ACS. Okay. So I thought, okay, that's my contribution to society. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, I'm I'm now back home uh, <clears throat> with my uh, two brothers and sister and the folks. I'm back to Michigan. I um, completed my 
work at uh, Michigan in chem engineering and graduated in 47 um, with the idea that I was going to work for Dow Chemical. And um, a, the fellow who was involved with the hiring personnel department of Dow, uh, one Sunday uh, we were walking down the steps of the church and he came up to me and he says, uh, I understand um, Monsanto has given you an offer. And I said, yeah, in Dayton, Ohio, in research. I, I said, um, I'm excited about it. And he says, take it because Dow is not hiring me right now. Mm -hmm. They had had a 10% cut the year, the year before and uh, they were not hiring at this point. So um, I ended up with Monsanto Chemical Company in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, enjoyed the research work for a couple of years. Ended up with a couple of patents. But um, uh, as time goes on, one of the patents was dealing with dialkyl phosphites. Uh, this was a precursor to some insecticides. Okay. And um, the phosphorus chloride, phosphorus, phosphorus oxychloride, uh, rather potent chemicals to deal with. And um, uh, time goes on. I'm in now in St. Louis. And uh, I get a call from the Army Chemical Warfare Department. Muscle Shoals, and the, the fellow on the phone says, uh, Paul Gann? I said, yeah, that's me. He says, I'm looking at your notebook on dialkyl phosphites, and uh, that um, uh, very interesting. And I says, that work was to kill bugs, not people. Yeah. And uh, that has pretty much ended the conversation. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, I was surprised that the government can go anywhere at once f for um, information uh, dealing with national security. Right. right. No holes barred. So I, but then that's the way life is. Um, I worked for Monsanto for about 34 years including 14 years with Kim Strand, which was a joint venture that Monsanto had in the acrylic fiber business, a venture with, with um, American Viscose, which was an English operation, but at the time they were the largest rayon producer in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up uh, as director of uh, Nylon Technology which was actually a communication pro uh, issue, but uh, how, how do you I uh, also was involved in a lot of uh, smaller projects, which um, I enjoyed. These were projects where I came in as a troubleshooter or put oil on rough waters to quiet things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I met some very fine people and learned some management techniques. I uh, retired in, uh, when I was 57, I retired early. My wife and I figured we could get along all right. And um, so I moved to uh, Cape Coral, Florida where we lived for 20 years. The first 10 years I had a 30-foot sailboat, well used, and uh, then the last 10 years I played a lot of golf. Mm -hmm. And um, then my wife um, picked up a breast cancer, and um, uh, she, I think the 29 uh, lymph nodes were removed mm. when they did the surgery on her right breast. Wow. And uh, they were all positive. The um, oncologist 
was very pessimistic about her survival. Um, and he said, uh, I don't know what to do, but uh, there is a product that's out there that shows some pro uh, promise. Navadex, I think was the name. It was a British ICI development. And she put, uh, she was on that. Um, she would not talk to anybody um, at that time unless they had a cancer problem. She wanted to know how they got along and uh, had to learn anything she could about cancer. And um, within six months, um, she was back to normal. The, the drug apparently was effective. And um, so I think for the next 12 years, she played a lot of bridge and a lot of golf. In the meantime, uh, some longtime friends of ours uh, by the name of uh, Walter and Elizabeth Carter, uh, when Walter retired from Georgia Tech, the four of us would go on some major trips of, oh, a couple of weeks mm -hmm. trips, and uh, we got to know each other very well. And then our spouses, uh, Elizabeth's spouse and my spouse die. Uh, he died in December of six, seven, December of uh, two thousand ninety nine. Is that right? And my wife died two thousand. Wait a minute. Hold it. Nineteen ninety nine. He, de he died December 1999. Polly died in her uh, 87th birthday of uh, 2000. Uh, Elizabeth and I were still in contact, and uh, she had a. I'm living in Cape Coral, Florida, which is right across the river from Fort Myers, where my daughter lived, and Elizabeth had a, a sister living in Fort Myers. And um, so time goes on, and uh, Elizabeth and I agree that we're going to get married. <clears throat> Where are we going to live? Well, Elizabeth's roots, she's a native, native of Atlanta. Her roots are so deep, we were not going to move her out of here. So uh, I moved up to um, Atlanta, and in time we moved here to Park Springs. And um, I think the marriage has been good for both of us. <clears throat> We're both reasonably active. She is, uh, I think, super active. She's learned to paint and has developed an interesting skill. She was a piano teacher at home and uh, is still uh, active on the piano. And she developed a men's chorus group here uh, uh, where we now have 14 guys singing in it, and they're doing a pretty good job. We currently have a new conductor uh, who is also a member here and was a member of the Melatones, which is the name of the course. And um, I think that pretty well brings us up to date. Thank you, Paul. I have a few other questions, if yes. you don't mind. Um, so. How did your military service, military service experience affect your life? Um, I think I grew up. I, in my case, I had a very positive experience. Mm -hmm. uh, not just a Japanese experience, but uh, uh, New Guinea and the Philippines were not negative to me. They were mm -hmm. positive mm -hmm. experiences. And... Um, I can remember the trip from the Philippines to uh, Japan, where um, the fellow on our, I think they were, we were on LSTs. And uh, one of the fellows on, the, on our LST was having a appendicitis attack. Oh. And I th 
think they, they brought a larger boat. I don't know if it was a destroyer or what, mm -hmm. uh, alongside our, our uh, gadget and um, watched them haul its fella between the two boats across open water. And of course, the boats were not synchronized and mm -hmm. how they rocked, but they were able to keep the guy from getting wet. Yeah, wow. And that was, to me, an interesting uh, experience on how the Navy mm -hmm. handles uh, transportation of an individual from one ship to another underway. Sure. What are some life lessons you learned from your military service? What are some life lessons that you learned from your service? Always think positive. Okay. Don't waste your time on negative aspects. And um, the uh, military, the routine, the insistence, insistence of following orders, uh, because other people's lives are dependent upon that particular order. So you don't question them, you go ahead and do the best you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, so although I was not, I didn't particularly care to be in the military, uh, the experience nevertheless, I think uh, helped me grow up to be a little more open-minded. Right, right. Uh, how has military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? The military is an absolute necessity. Um, I think we have learned over the years that war is hell. All you do is tear people apart and tear things apart. <clears throat> but there are times you've got to defend yourself. Mm -hmm and you cannot hesitate. If you're gonna defend yourself, do it right now. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, under today's situations, uh, there's some bad people out there and we need to defend them from them. Right. Is there any message that you'd like to leave for future generations who might see this interview? Grow up. Would you like to elaborate a little bit? <laughs> the, um, liberty is not automatic. Mm -hmm. Freedom is not automatic. And you're going to have to state your ground and um, <clears throat> you may have to fight again to preserve the concept of freedom and liberty and the way we do business. Okay. I'm, uh, I think, no, I'm not gonna get into politics. That, that may be a good idea. Is there anything that you haven't, that we haven't covered that you'd like to say in closing, Paul? No, I think I've summarized as well as I can off the top of my head. Thank you very much. Can I ask just a couple questions? Sure, of course. Paul, can I ask you just a couple questions? For a price, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take you way back for just a second. I find it very interesting that your parents lived in Germany during World War I. Yes. And your mother and father watched all their boys go serve in World War II. Yeah. Did they ever talk about World War One? Oh yes. Do you remember what uh, they said? The um, my dad was not in the military. He he got a deferment. Um, I think he had a heart problem or something. And um, but um, he allegedly had an enlarged heart. He died of a heart problem when he was 87. And um, my mother died at 102 uh, from recurrence of, or from breast cancer, which was diagnosed at 101. Wow. I say that, ladies, stay alert. 
I don't care how old you are, stay alert. And um, and the doctor came in to my mother's room, and she says, what are you doing here? And he says, I came here to talk about the removal of that breast. And she says, uh, and how long would that allow me to live? And he says, quote, lady, you've outlived the statistics. And she says, okay, I can handle it. And so she did not have the surgery. And uh, as time went on, that breast got very hard and I'm sure it was very painful. And I suspect that the, she was very, very strong pain pillars. Whether it was morphine or what, I do not know. But she'd never lost her composure. She was a happy girl, right till the end. So um, that was her experience. They, um, my sister died of um, a cancer of the duodenum. That's the area below your stomach where a lot of things come together, a lot of activity, an unusual cancer. And she had some surgery, which she now, uh, which later on she wished she'd never had. But then she died. And, um, my brother had died earlier, my oldest brother had died earlier from lung cancer, which had spread throughout his, his body, and he was a pretty heavy smoker. Uh, my middle brother died, I think, more of a heart problem, but he was also a heavy smoker. Uh, I never smoked a cigarette, but that didn't stop me from getting a, a cancer in my right lung. So. Um, as you grow older, just be prepared for a surprise. Gotcha. It may not gotcha. be a pleasant surprise, but it'll be there. Okay. Just a couple more. You yeah. mentioned the atomic bomb. Yeah. Do you remember where you were when you got that news? I was in the Philippines. How did everybody feel about that? What was the reaction? Relief. Um, it was apparent we were part of the invasion force mm -hmm. of Japan. And Japan, uh, when the military was active, was not the place to try to invade. We had gone through Guadalcanal and all of these other islands, and we know the price that the Japanese soldier was willing to pay. And they were brutal, absolutely brutal. And um, it would have been the same throughout the homeland of Japan. And uh, the coastline of Japan is not particularly uh, inviting. You don't have the Florida beaches to come in on, huh? or the Carolina beaches, okay. Um, the areas that I'm aware of uh, were very rugged. <clears throat> um, back to Colony, I was looking at some I exchanged letters with him um, over the first few years, and I was reading some of the letters that he wrote and um, uh, giving the difficulty the professors were having in survival. They were very underpaid, and um, they were living almost from hand to mouth. Uh, this was back in the, as late as 56. And um, some of his letters, I think, are, give you uh, kind of a picture of what the, the professor's side, anyway, uh, life was all about. You had a very unique experience attending school there. During... I was very fortunate. Did you get any pushback from your command or from your friends in the military? <clears throat> no, not really. Uh, all I can say is I think uh, the experience affected my um, tie with Monsanto. How? Um, because uh, during the job interview, 
I reviewed what we've all gone through. And um, I, I think that was such a positive experience that um, they were willing to take a risk on me. Okay. That, uh, and that was fortunate again. Um, I've had all kinds of fortunate situations. I picked the right parents. I uh, was fortunate to go through the military the way I did, get a job that was enjoyable, and actually in parts creative. Um, and then end up with a second marriage, which turned out to be a godsend. And so, um, no, that was, you took advantage of the situations. And I was just very, very fortunate. Thank you. Last question, what do you remember about coming home? Well, I have a photograph of me standing in Japan with a duffel bag and ready to board a, a truck to, to go to Nagoya, I think it's where we left from. But um, uh, we were all waiting to get orders to go home. And um, so I don't remember where I specifically, what town I was actually on, because I was not in Kyoto at this point. Um, and um, we, we, we were there for at this location to be picked up for probably close to a week. And um, the Army is always rush and hold. That's the way the life is. And um, so the place we were, the barracks we were at, the, um, uh, the guy in charge of uh, food, KP and all, came out one day and says, he needs some help. Now that's the only time I ever volunteered in the Army. Mm -hmm. I says, I would, like just, I would like to get on his good side. So I said, I'm here. So I, um, I peeled potatoes and I uh, learned to make hush puppies and all of this, and we got along fine. So I thought, well, why not? Again, that was a good experience. And got into, I'm assuming, San Francisco or Los Angeles. Your family meet you there, or did you? No, no. Um, we landed uh, back. I presume in the San Francisco area, and uh, took the train to. Um, now I got to look. Sorry, but my brain doesn't work all the time. <clears throat> took the train to where? Like my ch my di discharge papers. Um. Do, do, do. <clears throat> well, fooey. Where was I discharged? I think Jefferson Barracks in Illinois, I believe, is where I was discharged. And um, uh, no, nobody came. Um, I was just happy to get, to, and then from there I went to Springfield, Illinois to pick up my wife. And uh, then we went on to uh, Midland and sp spent some time with my folks. Um, we obviously didn't have a normal, what do you do after you get married? You have a- um, Honeymoon? Pardon? Honeymoon? Honeymoon. So, um, I borrowed my dad's car, and we drove up, uh, my wife and I drove up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and spent about a week uh, up there traveling around looking at waterfalls and, and, uh, and scenery and all. And that was our honeymoon. A little delayed, but still very effective. Thank you. Are we okay? We are good. We are good. And as, and as Sue says, as Sue says at the end of most interviews, welcome home.
Okay. Thank you. Off camera.